Hi, I'm Judith Panera, the Executive Director for AMC and AMC Foundation, the leading organization for all art curators, serving many, not few. It is a pleasure to welcome you to today's virtual discussion. Thank you for joining us. We hope that you, our community of colleagues, allies, and supporters around the globe are healthy and safe. In 2019, we held over 50 programs bringing together more than 1,300 individuals from 19 countries, providing an exchange of information on critical topics for the nonprofit arts community. Since early March of this year, our work has continued to address ongoing issues in the visual arts organizations, as well as concerns rising from the current pandemic. We've greatly enhanced an already robust online programming calendar by presenting varied offerings, such as the one we are gathered together for today. With your participation and feedback, we continue to ensure we are addressing the needs of our audience and moving the field forwards towards an equitable, inclusive, and sustainable future. For many years, we have been presenting webinars, virtual programming, which are accessible on our website through archived recordings. You can also find information on upcoming ones on our website as well at artcurators.org. We hope that they provide actionable advice, value, and connectivity. We welcome all nonprofit art curators to join our organization. Benefits of membership include networking with our global audience, access to discounted and free in-person and virtual programs and fellowships, and importantly, the opportunity to be part of a unified voice for and of curators. Additionally, our foundation serves the larger curatorial and arts community, and should you wish, donations are welcome from you as an individual, a corporation, and or foundation. Any amount will have direct impact on our work. You can see options for donating on our site. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the program. Hello, um, my name is Ni Kwakupong, Department Head for the Arts of Africa, Oceania, and Indigenous Americas, Detroit Institute of Arts. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the third session of the AMC webinar series designed to address current approaches, resources, and controversies surrounding the issue of provenance. The conversations around provenance for European and American objects have been going on for more than a century. Unfortunately, the, the same is not true of you know, art objects originating from historically marginalized non-Western cultures. That line of inquiry is only now taking root and being a relatively new province without a set methodology, it has often relied on long held approaches employed for Western art. Yet curators of non-Western art are painfully aware of the complexities and challenges that confront such investigations, especially the murky precision histories and spotty written records about such objects. Museums and auction houses have not been as thorough in demanding and reviewing records pertaining to ownership history. They have all too readily accepted information that begins after an object has arrived in North, North America or Europe. Thus, for African works, for example, the first Western owner of a work establishes its provenance. As such, most accession records are incomplete as they lack critical data about the original indigenous owners of artworks and intermediaries who ferried the works across land and sea to the West. The contemporary relevance of provenance research is indisputable. I consider the focus on the issue at this time very, very timely. As the debate about restitution and repatriation rages on and minority groups clamor for racial equality and justice, art museums are increasingly having to confront uncomfort uncomfortable questions about the sources and histories of objects in their collections. Some of these queries could potentially threaten, if not undermine, the integrity of Western museums' collections. In our current political climate, good provenance records can assist institutions in creating engaging minority com communities about cultural property issues. Obviously, 
retracing the exact circumstances under which an object was under which an object was um, was acquired and its subsequent movement from its point of origin to uh, to a Western collection is nearly impossible, especially long after the trail has gone cold. But it needs to be to begin somewhere. Today, I am joined by five esteemed colleagues who will speak to some of these issues and more. Our panelists' individual biogra biographies uh, um, can, be assessed, can be assessed online at artcurators.org, but briefly, they are Roslyn Adele Walker, Senior Curator of the Arts of Africa, the Americas and the Pacific at Dallas Museum of Art, Claudia Nisley, President, C. Nisley, Environmental Consultants and Program Analyst, Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, Hilk uh, Todd Arora, Department Head Oceania and Provenance Research Liaison Officer at Five Continents Museum in Munich, Julian Sigues, Williams Director, University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, and last but not the least, Vinny Noskov, Associate Professor of Classical Archaeology and Director of the Museum of Ancient Art and Archaeology at Arous, Arous um, University in Denmark. Our panelists will attempt to take the conversation about provenance a little further. Um, individually, each brings a wealth of re research experience and expertise in this critical area of our professional practice that pertain to art and art antiquities. Considering how little time we have at our disposal, um, I would like to um, um, pose four questions, four questions to our, um, to our um, panelists. Um, two to three speakers will have four minutes each to address each question. And we'll take questions from the audience um, during and after the presentation, but speakers will answer them during the Q and A um, after the pre and after the presentations. We can now begin, um, and the first question is: How can cultural institutions acknowledge and rectify incomplete or unknown acquisition records? Vinny. Thank you, Oni. Um, Thank you for this question. And um, as it was actually noted in one of the first webinars uh, in the first series, the incomplete and unknown acquisition records is more the norm than the exception. And that itself shows that this is an issue which we really have to, to deal with. My area uh, is classical antiquities. And there we could go a step further and say, that incomplete and unknown acquisition records are very often also a sign of a tainted collecting history, making it even more problematic. But this does not um, mean that we should not try to rectify them. Because if we ignore this aspect of the collections and intentionally disguise or ignore historically unjust collecting practices that have been part of a Western colonial ideology and practice, then that is not only highly unethical, but it also deprives us of getting a fuller understanding of the objects, the collections, and the role of our institutions today and in the past. I've just received um, funding for a project called Illicit Antiquities in the Museum, in which I'm going to uh, use provenance study to uh, work on this issue. It's a project on a pottery from Apulia, a region in Southern Italy. And that's a region that has for decades or even centuries been um, a victim of large-scale illegal excavation, which means that around 80% of the material in museums around the world today has no information about the provenance. And it has gone through these museums through the international and often illegal antiquities market. Um, in my museum, it's a university collection, uh, we have got a long-term loan from Italy of fragments from Apulia that were seized from the warehouse of the antiquities dealer Robin Symes in Geneva in 2014. And in this project, we are going to uh, use provenance studies in order to uh, trace the objects from uh, the dealer's warehouse back into the original places where they might have been 
uh, found or illegally excavated. And we're going to do that in cooperation with uh, the museums in the region. Also using other kinds of methods like archaeometry on the objects to figure out where they came from. Here, provenance studies are absolutely essential in order to uh, understand what a deep influence um, this collecting history has had on the research and understanding of this material. And I think this is also relevant for many non-Western uh, uh, objects that the collecting history has shaped the research and our understanding. So if we don't somehow uh, open up for understanding these processes, we won't be able to get further. Uh, I just want to add one more thing, and that is that we are going to exhibit the processes of this research at the same time as we do it. Because one of the things in my own field where provenance studies has not really gained uh, influence yet is in the exhibitions. We have had an increase in provenance studies and it is uh, published in scholarly catalogs and on databases. But if you go into the museum exhibitions, especially the permanent exhibitions, this information is lacking. You only have small labels, maybe it says a collector, but it's only one specific point of the history of the life of object life. Um, and it doesn't say anything about how the object came there and all the, the, the problematic uh, histories that involves this collecting history. And that I think is an area where we still have to do quite a lot of uh, work in order somehow to integrate um, provenance studies in the exhibitions because normal visitors, they don't go to the databases on the internet. They don't read scholarly catalogs. They want to go to the museum and see the objects live on the site. So they need actually to get these complicated histories with the objects in the museum. So I think to rectify on the long run, this is one of the areas where we can still do quite a lot of things, especially in, in my field, but I guess also in, in non-Western objects. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Rosalind? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Um, I believe in transparency, um, and I believe that we should make it clear, you know, the sources of our information and how there are shortcomings there. In the early years, in the 60s and 70s, when a lot of collectors in the United States were buying art from dealers and so forth, they were buying works that had incomplete information. Uh, we can tell people, you know, that our visitors, um, that our resources, I mean, the knowledge that we have comes from missionary accounts or from anthropologists who were there, early travelers and so forth. But now the issue of, of uh, who owns or who should own has become an issue. And I think we have to address that. I reinstalled my gallery in 2015, and in the uh, preparation for that, I visited several museums in the United States and in Europe. And I think it was maybe the Brooklyn Museum that actually had a disclosure statement uh, at the time around, I'm talking about maybe 2013. I'm not sure what that looks like now, um, but I thought that was very brave to do it. If I were reinstalling my gallery, uh, and someone who will come after me will certainly do that, they will you know, take a different approach and, and be more transparent and expose these issues. But who knows when that will be, and it's kind of tongue in cheek, you know, what will be in the museum to show. Uh, things are happening so fast, and we've already seen you know, the Black Panther come to life in the K. Brown Lee Museum. So uh, these are, you know, kind of nervous times for many of us. Okay. Um, so the second question, uh, first of all, is there any additional comment from our panelists with regard to um, this issue of rectifying incomplete records? Okay. The second question is what unique issues confront provenance research for objects from non-Western cultures? Rosalind, you're yes. up again. All right, may, may I have the first slide, uh, please? 
it would be page two, yeah, slide two. I, um, one of the ways to address this is to do, um, well, about incomplete information and um, I recently did a show called The Power of Gold. You're, you're looking at a gungun costume and I'll talk about that in a minute. And I, and I introduced in, in the chapter on a provenance essay is that works of art have a history of provenance, provenance. Bills of sale, artists and collectors diaries and catalog resumes are some of the resources available to reconstruct the history of a work of art. Unfortunately, however, these resources are not generally available when one is researching African tradition-based or classic artworks. And I thought uh, a wonderful solution to this uh, is what Ms. Kristen Windmuller Luna did at the Brooklyn Museum uh, with the uh, Igungu masquerade costume that you see on the cover. Um, she exhausted the literature and then went to Nigeria to do field work and was able to uh, trace uh, this costume back to uh, the family um, that uh, had made it and their name, uh, da, 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 da. now I'm blanking on it, but, but this is one solution. Could I have the next one? So I commend her. This is very heartwarming. Um, in this case, here's a similar uh, Igungun costume, masquerade costume from the Dallas School of Art. Probably came from the same workshop. I need to go to Nigeria to research that. In my case, as far as I got, was uh, to be able to identify the uh, person in this panel on the back of one of the panels shows lawyer Wells Palmer, and turns out that he uh, helped the King of Lagos regain the throne after he was deposed. And actually, uh, with the help of a wonderful intern, Shannon Carroll, to find the court uh, proceedings, the court record on the internet. So, um, you you know may use some unusual or um, resources that you might not have thought of uh, to to uh, do your research. May I have the next one? Just zip through these. The collection at the Dallas Museum of Art is founded on part of the Stillman Collection, which the museum acquired in uh, 1969. And the Stillmans uh, were friends of Franz Boas back in the 30s. And um, they, he guided them in their collecting uh, of African art in Belgium. And I was looking at a Christie's, Christie's Masterworks catalog from, uh, I think it was a year ago, and came across this picture. Uh, that was uh, of uh, Jean Walshot's gallery and was able to identify two of our pieces among the photographs. And then, and you see them on the screen. It's absolutely amazing because it, it helps me know where these pieces were in, uh, in the 1930s. Um, the next one, next, uh -huh. and you can go to the same resource of the, the, the the uh, photographer was a woman named Germaine Van Paris, uh, uh, one of the rare female photographers uh, of her time. And she photographed all of Walshot's collection, the thousand pieces or something like that. So you can register and peruse this and you made your own works there, of works from your own collection. And then in the next one, please. Rose, you, uh, your time is almost up. Okay, fine. But you, know, you but can finish the last slide. But to get my drift, can look in what may be unconventional places. The Nigerian National Museum has a wonderful archive of photographs uh, that I would recommend that everyone uh, have a look at because you just may find objects that are in your collection among those images. Thank you. Okay.
and then uh, here came, um, somebody asked for me to re repeat the question. The question is what unique issues confront provenance research for objects from non-Western cultures? Exactly. Yes. We so don't have, oops, sorry. Here came. Here, Thank here. you, Ni. Yes. Hello, everybody. Let me first start by saying that um, I work in an ethnological museum and that we are not only dealing with, with artifacts which would be um, called in the Western concept art, but also with a lot of artifacts which are actual everyday artifacts. So to come back to the question, I see three major points. Firstly, um, when dealing with provenance research regarding non-Western context or colonial context, we are dealing with a very long time span. We could set a starting point, for example, at 1492, when um, the Americas were discovered and um, Europeans and um, Native Americans began object transfers, to put it neutrally. We could also go back to a longer period of time when talking about Africa. So um, we are dealing with a very, very, very long time span, especially if compared to provenance research on Nazi looted art, which of course in Germany, where I come from, informs um, the discussion quite a bit. Secondly, we are dealing basically with the whole world, and that means that we can have very different legal and cultural systems of ideas what actually property is, how property transfer can take place um, legally or illegally or in a, in a context of injustice. So we are dealing with very, very many different uh, cultural systems over a very, very vast uh, period of time, which makes the provenance research really complex. And thirdly, I see that the sources we are using are very complex as well. Apart from archival materials, which again are the main source when talking about Nazi looted art provenance research, um, I think we should, when talking about non-Western artifacts, we should also focus on the materiality of objects that could tell us quite a bit. My favorite example from the Pacific are those fish hooks from Tahiti in Western collections, which according to one scholar show beautiful bindings and iconography, but um, with which you actually cannot fish. So they were made for Western collectors who wanted to see how were they made, what were the materials, um, how were the bindings, how did they look like, but they just were not function. Uh, functioning objects. So this would raise a complex issue of do we have to repatriate these artifacts, for example. So the materiality is one of the sources which can give us a number of hints apart from archival sources, but much more important is to get in contact and to discuss and exchange with members of the uh, source communities of the artifacts. And again, we are dealing with many different cultural systems and many different communities here. I feel the main challenge here is to find actually in those source communities, those persons who are authorized by their communities and who are knowledgeable about the artifacts. And this can be quite a challenge. I see a bit with concern some museums who tend to address artists, um, museum or university professionals or politicians in the countries uh, where the, the artifacts originate from. But in my opinion, uh, if you want to have a just and fair way of dealing with provenance research, you should address and should try to find those persons who are authorized by their communities to talk and negotiate about the artifacts in question. And it is their wishes that museum practitioners like us and stewards of the objects like us should listen to. So this would be, in my opinion, the first um, approach to doing provenance research regarding artifacts from non-Western sources. Thank you. Um, is there any rejoinder or any additional comment from our panelists? Okay. And this includes all history sources, of course. So you really should get into contact and into discussion. Okay. Yeah, I think everybody agrees. 
Rosalind, do you have an, any additional comments? No, I'm just thinking about, you know, to, to whom does one uh, discuss and you know, who's the person, the person in charge, the person responsible, and that can be problematic. You know, yeah, think... knowing who that person is and not getting into trouble. Right. Yeah, um, again, if sometimes these are groups of persons who, um, who, who have who have owned a, an artifact. So uh, it's not like in the West that it's usually usually an individual who owns an artifact. It can be a whole group, and there must be discussions, and it's a it's a complicated issue. It, okay. it, it, it will, yes, it is because it's a case of who had the right to dispose of the object in the yes. first place, and that's really you can think of gazillion examples of how yes. that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the third question is, how can the repatriation of objects in our collections shift from a claim of ownership to an opportunity to form new relationships? with um, original owners. How can the repatriation of objects in our collections shift from a claim of ownership to an opportunity to form new relationships with um, non-Western communities? Vinny. Uh, thank you, yes. I mean, uh... It of course starts with the concept of ownership that Hilke was just mentioning is a concept which is differently understood depending on what kind of context you're in, what kind of uh, community. Um, and the whole problem with the words concept and also property is of course that there are some uh, specific ideas about ownership involved. And the first step is somehow to move away from that into concepts of caretaker or heritage, which does not have these ownership things. But um, it's, of course, uh, difficult because of these legal elements, which are different from uh, place to place. I mean, within my own field, classical antiquities, um, there have been a number of repatriation cases uh, during the last years following what was called the antiquity scandal, which was this discovery of art dealers' archives, which were disclosing widespread illegal trade. Uh, and there, the Getty Museum in the US has been one of the uh, larger institutions that has uh, um, developed a new partnership with the especially Italian uh, antiquity authorities and museums, um, which uh, is a new way of working together that can promote a uh, much deeper understanding of uh, collections. These kind of partnerships are on an institutional level, but what has shown, especially in the Danish case, because there has also been an agreement with the Nukasberg Bibliothek in Copenhagen in 2016, it took quite a long time, but they ended up getting uh, an agreement. When it uh, uh, was moved from the level of the highest authorities to the museums, because it was easier to make these with people who knew each other and were able to cooperate than on a, a diplomatic level. So that was uh, one of the things, but uh, there's no doubt that developing partnership is the way forward in trying to resolve these complex issues of ownership of objects in, in museums and, and rethinking the concept of ownership. I think there are some good examples in, in the Western world uh, for that, but whether uh, it's not possible just to take them and transfer them into other cultures. I think one of the very important issues here is, as Hilke is also saying, each case is different. So you really have to, to move into the specific area and, and work with, with this specific case every time you work in order to find the right people to work with. That's uh, absolutely essential. Thank you. Thank you. Are you okay? Yes. Um, well, first, let me say that repatriation can be, but not necessarily must be, the desired outcome of provenance research. And in my experience, when dealing with Pacific communities, which is my field of expertise, 
often it is already the entering into talks which is seen as an asset because in Polynesian or many Polynesian societies, for example, objects still are used and have been used in the past um, as gifts or in exchange to establish important relationships or to validate these relationships. And um, the talks which I have had with members of Pacific communities about artifacts which are now in our museums have actually confirmed this that the artifacts are often seen as a vehicle um, to enter new, to re-enter relationships and to renew these relationships. This can result in repatriation hopes or claims, but in my opinion, with most specific communities, for most of the objects, it's not in the foreground. There are other things like, for example, forgotten skills, which um, can be seen in some of the artifacts which are kept in the Western museums, where one would like to um, get the young people from the communities of origin to see how these artifacts were actually made, because one has forgotten how they were made in the countries of origin. Or capacity building has been in the foreground quite a bit in these discussions. Um, help in writing the wrongs of the colonial past by getting help in building cyclone or insect proof museums, getting young people over to Europe and have them trained in state of the art Western museum uh, skills. Things like that have much more been in the foreground in my experience when dealing with people from the Pacific. And it all come, comes back in a nutshell to the re-establishing or the new establishing of relationships and where these relationships go and whether they end in the repatriation of artifacts or something completely different, um, this, that is quite open. And again, I would say this is something where we should listen as museum practitioners to the wishes of the persons from the, the uh, societies of origin. Thank you. Um, and Claudia? Mike. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Ah, sorry. So sorry. Um, so I want to go back to the term ownership for a minute. And of course, my work is in, in the Western world in the United States with um, and the Pacific with indigenous populations and uh, under one of our laws, Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, uh, there's a term ob items of cultural patrimony. And those items cannot be owned by an individual of that culture if they belong to the entire group. And so that, that deviates from individual ownership quite a bit. And so when you get into whether it's repatriation or curation of collections, um, you need to build consensus with the entire group, not with an ind individual. So going back to the question, um, how do you shift into uh, forming new relationships and taking these opportunities? And I think certainly in my experience, there's a couple of very good examples, one of which is quite current. It's in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, the Anchorage Museum they had an opportunity to rework the relationship with Alaska Native Villages in that they expanded and built a new addition to their existing museum. And during that process, they worked with the indigenous uh, villages and the collections, and they came to an agreement that the museum would keep the collections, however, the villagers would have access to them anytime they wanted. And to do so, they have this very special room, it's a very large room, where and very private, so that those members of the villages can take whatever items that they want to practice or teach their youth, which as, as um, Hilke said, is quite important, um, and sharing the past cultures with youth. And 
so that they are able to perform private sacred ceremonies. Um, they are able to continue to use the items. And then when they're finished, those items get rotated back into the um, exhibit. And the exhibit, uh, they're glass cases. So you, you see all sides of various uh, objects. And the villagers and leadership of those villages help to create what is written by way of um, translation, interpretation of those items. And it's also printed in their native language. So that if schools or youth come to see the exhibits, not, not with their, their villagers, their parents, their grandparents, they can read them in their own language. Um, and, and, and we've already lost a lot of our native speakers and native languages. So that's key and very important. So I'll okay. stop there. Okay, thank you. Julian, Julian? Uh, thanks, Nee. I have a, an example I think speaks to this question quite recently. Uh, the majority of the collections of the Penn Museum are, are archaeological, so they have very good provenance. But there are a couple of collections which are the exception to this, and one of them is the African collections. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, in November, we opened our new galleries of Africa, and um, uh, this collection contains a large quantity of objects from Benin. And we opted for some fairly radical transparency where we, in the gallery themselves, both in labels and in videos, acknowledge the looted context of this material, um, walk our audience through what the British Expeditionary Force did to acquire them. Um, in addition, actually had letters from the directors from the 1910 and 1920s who um, were, were dealing with the art market to acquire them. So our lead curator, Takufu Zimbiri, really saw these galleries as the beginning of a conversation about potential repatriation of objects. Not all, but certainly some. And to that end, he went to, to a number of African museums, um, the, the Museum of the Royal Benin Palace, the National Museum of Nigeria, Mali, Senegal, and others, and started a conversation. Now, we assumed the conversation would really start and end with repatriation, but it didn't. Um, it, it really started with the, the earnest uh, request for meaningful collaboration. Uh, repatriation is definitely still on the table, but what they were equally interested in is loan programs with other objects from other parts of our collections, um, you know, as, as Helki mentioned, the, the desire to have uh, um, the staff swaps and training programs was really, really, really front of mind with them. And to, um, and to develop a relationship that wasn't just sort of one and done, that was meaningful, that would last, you know, a number of years and could, could um, be mutually beneficial. So um, and the gallery has, has just opened and this conversation has just begun. But I think it's a, a really exciting way to, to, to look at how provenance research can be done. Um, and, you know, in some cases it wasn't, it, it wasn't repatriation that they wanted to discuss, but, you, you know, maybe reparation. Um, so that was on the table as well. I mean, we were very actually influenced by uh, a number of presentations that Nee has given on this topic. Um, and uh, we also spent a great deal of time um, in community outreach to African American communities within Philadelphia and to see what were the questions that they wanted addressed in these galleries as well. Um, and so, yeah, a very fruitful um, experience for us and on how what starts off as a, a you know, a, a repatriation and provenance question can very quickly turn into deep and rich um, relationships. I think you muted me. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, for most indigenous peoples, 
Reclaiming ownership of valued relics from Western museums offers opportunities to retell their histories and to reframe their identity. How can the repatriation of objects to their communities of origin constitute a form of healing? How can the repatriation of objects to their communities of origin constitute a form of healing? Rosalind? Well, I want to show, could we pull up eight, the Apple Akam? Ideally, when objects return home, um, they may be given new meaning because the old meaning is lost. Uh, they may find a new use for them, a new understanding, and that's a good thing. Ideally, the, the, per, the institution that, uh, rest, that returned the object has a re continuous relationship with the recipients at the other end. Uh, I wanted to show the, the Afro Akam comes up, and I hope I'm not out in left field. Um, and there's an egregious mistake here. The return of the Afro Akam to Cameroon was in seven, uh, 1973. And the story, you can find it on the internet and in Chris Mullen Kramer's uh, essay in the uh, Collecting and Provenance book that came out in uh, last year. Uh, and it, it starts with, an, with the, uh, the theft happened sometime in the 1960s. And almost 10 years later, it, this object surfaces in a gallery in New York. Tamara Northern is organizing an exhibition and she borrows it and it's seen and um, the uh, quest to, to send it back to Africa begins and it is a success because Warren Robbins, whom you see to the left of the Afrocom, uh, this wonderful carved wood and beaded figure of a royal, um, uh, facilitated the repatriation. He was able to find a sponsor to purchase the object from the sculpture from the art dealer and to arrange to, to take it back to Cameroon. So uh, there are stories in, in the news about, you know, the joyous return and everybody was happy, happy, happy. But I was trying to find out what's happened since then. Um, and you know, who's the relationship with, but where is the object? And uh, it seems that it came back on tour in 1985. And when I went to the Cameroon website for the uh, National Museum, Yoande, and the, you, you know, you go to those pages and you see a Brazilian object and it was not among them. So, you know, I wonder, I wonder how that story finished. And uh, if and someone knows, I, I would love for them to tell us and if there was a relationship. Um, I have not had the experience of, of I forbid, repatriating anything. Uh, but we have, uh, in the most recent exhibition on Asante art, uh, tried to create a relationship with the Asante community in the Dallas Fort Worth area succeeded up to a point. Um, the challenge is to keep people engaged, you know, not just for the event, but that it's a long lasting and it, it takes work, uh, which I'm sure we're all eager to put in. Um, so it doesn't answer anything, but it gives you something to think about. Okay. So, Claudia? Claudia? I'm sorry, it's the, the muting. I just unmuted. Um, oh, okay. Sorry. So, in the United States, uh, in the mid to late uh, 1800s, there were several laws that were passed wherein um, Native American tribal members if they practice their traditional religion, traditional medicine, and many of their customs, they were put in jail. And so what happened was many of the cultural practices went underground. So when you talk about healing within a culture and healing within a community, 
the very fact that that um, when an item is repatriated, that the elders who are still alive or who know the stories of their grandfathers, great grandfathers, be, it begins to become alive again, that practice. And they can at, hopefully continue at this point in time to be very open in their practice with the objects and um, the language and the songs and the oral history that goes with it. And much, of course, was forgotten and not passed down through generations because once the various practices and customs went underground, um, much more difficult to for the the next generation and the next generation to continue these practices so one of the most important things i think is when those elders that are still alive at this point are able to touch hold feel view in their own culture not within a museum or not within a a, a museum drawer in a back room but within their own culture in their own landscape, where those items originated and were made and manufactured and so on, they begin to remember all kinds of important and significant cultural um, stories that go with those objects. And so it's a renewal process through multi-generations that I think is very key and very important to keep those cultures alive and of course, they do change over time, as Rosalind said. Um, and so there may be new practices associated. Um, but it, 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 those memories are revived and reconstituted and then continue forward. Thank you. Okay. Julian? Well, I'd just like to add to what, what Claudia said is you, um, so not only have, you know, many uh, cultural aspects of indigenous groups have been lost but also many technologies and one of the things that, that we've experienced at the Penn Museum is when objects have been repatriated or when various Native American groups have come to visit us and take a deep dive in the collection those technologies can be actually rebuilt um, and this is everything from how do you make a uh, um, an Inuit seal skin canoe to like the very complicated forms of basketry and pottery, uh, which are not no longer made anymore, but can actually be sort of reconstituted and objects are given back, or at least free access to collections are given. And I think that's one of the obligations that museums have. It also further enriches our understanding of our own collections as well. And I really believe that, that no um, uh, uh, galleries now of indigenous material should be done without a deep and meaningful partnership with the indigenous groups involved. Mm, well said. Are, are there any other comments that from our panelists? Um, anything anyone wants to add? We have a little bit of time, about four minutes to. <laughs> okay. Without any, uh, any further comments, um, I would like to open the lines for our audience to submit questions um, via the Q&A um, throughout the webinar. And, uh, um, and I encourage our speakers to jump in if they have uh, answers to those questions. Any questions? Um, I think I have a couple here. And one questioner asks, for me and all Roslyn, as Ni nee said, most museums with colonial era collections of African arts have little or little to no information about the African dealers who sold objects to col colonial offices, traders, travelers, etc. How do you suggest museums and curators can research these individuals? and how can they recognize African dealers in the gallery space in the way that isn't essentializing? Thank you so much for this question. I've been meaning to raise the issue, but um, I was afraid I was going to be chased out of the webinar. <laughs> African dealers. 
But I think, I think you know, one of the uh, things that we need to keep in mind is that uh, dealing in art, uh, for many of the African dealers, um, has been uh, a family tradition. Many of the families, many of the um, old dealers, their children and grandchildren are still dealing in art. And my conversations with some of them you know, has shown that um, their grandparents kept documents or kept written um, ledgers of important works that they sold, most of which are in museum collections or in private collections, and they are still being sold on the art market. So if you are lucky to encounter any of these objects, I think that you know, it's important to start um, looking very closely at if there is any African dealer who actually was responsible and if any of those dealers have you know, relatives who are still dealing in art. That's one way to go, but I think I can answer the rest of the question later on. Um, there is another question which says, what strategies do you suggest for determining who is a cultural authority in the source community? How do you negotiate local politics as well as international law? Yeah. Any takers? Yeah, of course, that's one of the crucial questions. Thank you very much for posing it. Uh, I guess, first of all, you need expertise in your own field. You will have established contacts as a museum practitioner already, but of course this is only the very first step. So you should try to get into contact via what we call the snowball system. You should be, be um, passed on and on till you get to the, to the specialists. And um, this is complex in so far as well as the specialists can be descendants, they can be religious practitioners, they can be clan elders, um, depending on the artifacts you are dealing with. And of course, very often we have the situation that there are uh, different opinions in the society of origin as well. And it's, it's uh, very difficult to deal with this. Whom do you talk to? Ideally, all the parties who are concerned with the artifacts. It's not an easy task. May I? May I jump yep. in? Yes. Um, I did field research on the Gungo Masquerade uh, Society in Abiokuta uh, a long time ago. And I um, began my search with, by talking to the, the, the lo local rulers. Abiokuta was too complicated. I chose one in the area of Abiokuta where I live, and he was instrumental in helping me meet people. But it turns out that the washerman, the batman in the catering rest house where I was staying that summer was head of the Yagungun. Actually, there is a woman who is at the apex, but he was able to take me to meetings. And I, quote unquote, learned as much as uh, an outsider and a woman could uh, from, from, that, uh, from that society, from that association. Um, so, you know, you, you, you talk, you can start with the leadership and work your way down and maybe you'll get lucky and discover that the person you are looking for is right under your nose. Um, which it was what happened in my case. The other question is, do you think there is any benefit in American museums working together in repatriation efforts? Yes. Yeah, I, I do. Um, I mean, if every museum, for example, with Benin Holdings were to give back three objects, that would be a significant volume of material returning to African museums. Um, it, the disadvantage for museums working together is museums are very idiosyncratic places um, and you know getting them all to agree uh, on what's the best way going forward is going to is going to take time. 
Um, whereas, you know, museums could move at a, at a faster clip um, working on their own with individual partnerships. Um, but I, I, would, I would think that uh, working together is the best long-term solution for, for sure. Yeah. There's always the, a, a, a possibility of exchange. The object for a training or technological assistance or, you know, what, whatever is required at the other end. Uh, but I hope it's not going to be number three because that <laughs> cleans out our few holdings at the Dallas Museum of Art. <laughs> Don't do that. So what strategies do you suggest for determining who is a cultural authority in a source community? How do you negotiate local politics as well as international law? Is that the same question I asked earlier? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Somebody is asking, if you had objects in your institution that were considered for repatriation, how did you move forward with the discussions regarding repatriation at your institution with the museum administration? Where there are setbacks, where, where there are setbacks, oh, the person made a mistake, where there are setbacks and challenges, what advice would you have for provenance researchers who stumble upon objects that may have questionable provenance history? I think you'd have to own up <laughs> to the truth. And what if the institution is unwilling to accept the truth because it's too bitter to swallow? I think that, yes. that, that falls on to um, you know, the, the museum administration to make the case that this material was collected unethically. Mm -hmm. And then for us to fulfill our mission, repatriation must be, must be considered. Um, the, the, an example from my own museum is some scientific research on some objects acquired from the art market more or less proved that these objects were actually from Troy in Turkey. And after a lengthy and very fruitful negotiation with the Turkish government, they were returned because we had essentially proven that they were looted. But in the course of your due diligence, you know, before you purchase an object or accept it as a gift. You know, you have to do the research and you have to tell the, you know, the unhappy truth to the prospective donor or dealer, what you found and why you can't accept it. It's not that simple all the time. No, it isn't. Um, but you museum, are. Yeah, but you have to realize that museums sometimes feel like they have their fingers in the mouth of a donor. And so if you yeah. knock the donor on the head, you know, the natural reaction is to bite you. And I think that you know, that has been a problem because in the, um, in the attempt to help donors you know, continue to look favorably upon the institution and also to direct donations to them, they don't want to offend. And some donors are very powerful. You know, yeah. So I think, I think that you know, we have to deal with the politics of museums here in our institutions before we start you know, um, claiming that you know, there isn't much that we can do about it. We have to deal with internal politics and how museums can, how administrations can overcome that. You know, that's totally beyond us as curators because we are not, you know, we are, we are not in charge. So I think that's something that we need to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Any additional? Um, there's a, a question that's very important. It says, since the objects are irreplaceable and in that sense priceless, and the groups may not have the means to care for and protect them now, are there ever stipulations 
that the door stays open for them to renegotiate whatever agreement is put in place. A later agreement can be made at such time as they are prepared to care for and protect them. I, I would like to contribute to that question okay. quickly. Um, there is an issue along the coastlines with rising sea levels. And again, it's another Alaska case where many of the villages have to be relocated back from the seashore. And the museum in Fairbanks, Alaska is trying to repatriate items to the native villagers, uh, but by law they're required to do. However, the villagers don't want them because they're in the process of moving and moving and moving back from rising sea levels. So when they have gone back in and negotiated the agreement uh, for the museum to keep in perpetuity those artifacts. However, they also have the right at some point to change that and have those items repatriated if they so desire. And it's, it's an ever changing, because of climate change, it's an ever changing, ever moving kind of process. Thank you. There is another question. Building up these relationships, as well as doing the provenance research itself, requires patience and time. Yet with increasing public attention on these issues, especially on social media, there is an expectation for things to happen quickly yeah. or frustration if they don't. How do you deal with that? I feel honestly, um, although it's very hard, that it's our duty to say that we need the time and that it's not honest to go for quick solutions just because there's pressure from the media or the social media or the politicians. If you want to do a good provenance research, if you want to have um, good um, talks and um, mm, build a, an atmosphere of trust with the persons in the, the societies of origin, you just need time. It's not a quick thing. But we have the same problem in Germany that there's often pressure from politics, from the media and from the social media to be very quick and to have one solution for many cases. But every case is different and needs time and needs um, to look into it deeply. There is another question. I am working on the provenance for an Armenian religious object. We are currently dealing with an issue where it was discovered that one of the former owners was notorious for selling fake objects. How would we go about researching further when there is so much doubt in its validity? <clears throat> Any, anyone? <laughs> well, if, if the seller is notorious for selling fakes, I would probably keep my hands away from that. <laughs> but actually, I would like to add something to the previous question about this uh, with the time issue, because I think it's, it's um, I mean, it has to do again with the transparency issue. The, the more open you are about the processes in museums and how we work, the more we can also um, justify what is actually needed in order to build these relationships and make the best solutions for all parties. And I think in some cases where these quick fixes have been demanded is also because um, institutions tend to uh, keep quiet not opening up uh, for what is actually going on. And I think it's necessary to be more uh, open in, what, in the processes and also be willing to, to share difficult, difficult processes and get difficult um, uh, negotiations which are going on. It's, uh, or, or if it's necessary to keep this internal, then you also have to tell that that is necessary. I think the more open we are, the more transparent, the more it's also easier somehow to, uh, to get the time for this work. 
I think dealers also make mistakes and some dealers are a lot more transparent than others and are willing to accept that they did not follow um, the right protocols. Um, some dealers are notorious definitely for selling you know, uh, fake objects. But I think we also have to sometimes make room for dealers who genuinely make mistakes and try to correct them. And those who sometimes go out of their way to prove to the rest of the world that they don't deal in fakes by um, you know, selling some great pieces. So that is going to be you know, um, something that all of us will have to make uh, personal decisions on. Um, now, I, I don't want to paint every dealer or a dealer as you know, trading in fakes for the rest of his or her life. You know, it, because sometimes you know, it can be dangerous too. Uh, it means that you lose out on important objects if um, you don't want to deal with them at all. Um, and somebody actually um, sent in um, a, a suggestion um, to, for the person who asked this question to cons contact um, another person in the Metropolitan Museum. Um, the name is missing on my screen, but um, I, will, I will answer that question. I will send the information to, um, to, to the uh, questioner very soon. There is another question here. It says, are there specific examples of where museums, collections that ended up in the West were able to train and or bring museums in the originating culture to a standard of conservation and exhibition mm -hmm. so that their objects could be preserved for the original homeland? I have an example. Okay. Um, in the state of Maine, uh, there were some excavations, uh, and it has to do with the Environmental Protection Agency and World War II drums and, and um, the very dangerous uh, chemicals in the soil. But the Indian tribe, uh, they wanted some of the artifacts, and it turned out they wanted all of them. And so the, what they did, they wrote an agreement that called for, it gave the tribe three years to raise the money uh, to build a museum. And in the interim, the artifacts were kept at an accredited museum in, in Maine. And the second provision was when the tribe, ex when the museum was finished, uh, being built and the tribe accepted those artifacts back, they were trained in laboratory and curation methods and that was all stipulated in the agreement. And, and of course it took a number of years, but it's a good example. Okay. I can't think of an American example, but the British Museum for you know decades had a wonderful program of training in, in West Africa among their former colonies. And um, that worked very well for, for a long time. And we hope it will continue to. But, but one of the issues is, is, if, is, is getting our African colleagues to America so we can help. Uh, getting visas. The American government, my experience two years ago, National Museums and Monuments people from Ghana wanted to come. And we uh, couldn't get, you know, the inv invitation was extended, paper, letters written, and uh, no visas. Wow. So they couldn't come to talk about the possibility of having an exchange or, you know, uh, assistance or you know services of some kind in exchange for whatever we couldn't do that because we couldn't couldn't get together in the same room could not get the visa um, I have room for just one more comment from our families so jump in if you can okay I would like to take the opportunity to thank you know, the, our AMC colleagues, um, Monica Valenzuela for setting up the session and 
and everyone for attending this AMC webinar. I'm especially grateful to our wonderful panelists uh, for the I, wonderful ideas they've put on the table. And um, I hope that uh, those whose questions were not answered um, can look forward to um, text messages from our panelists um, addressing uh, their individual questions. Um, I would like to also remind our audience that uh, a recording of this session will be added to the AMC archive and made available to all participants within one week. Um, I look forward to um, working with you know, um, another webinar in the future, and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much, um, my fellow um, panelists, for such a wonderful and spirited discussion. Thank you. Thanks. Goodbye.